Right now, you're brandishing an assault rifle, and we just heard a fighter jet fly by. We're on the top of a mountain, yeah, our neighbors in Lebanon shoot rockets here and there sometimes. I wanted to be here because it's such a calm place. Most likely throughout the video, I'm not going to use the word Palestinian because that's a made-up thing. It is the epicenter of Jewish Kabbalah and mysticism in this day. I like to call the people who live here kind of like Jewish hippies. I try to praise John in the morning every morning. This is technically the, the great synagogue of Tzfat. This synagogue, no one in Tzfat 400 years ago ever had any recollection of it being built. They woke up and the synagogue was here. In Tzfat we call this the sound cave. It's really epic. <laughs> From 1948. Oh, this is from the independence. It's littered with bullet holes. Bullet holes all over this country. We were two people here, both fighting for the same land, and we won. It's very simple. What's your family history? How did a Yemenite end up in Sfat? Oh, that's a good question. My father is his color. Nathan's father is my color, kind of. <laughs> yes, and I'm Ashkenazi. Yeah. We're not European and we're not white when it comes to cultural whiteness. I'm a Jew. <laughs> I'm my own people. I have a 3,000 year old history. So we started to dig to move the plumbing to put the bathroom in a different location and the drill went through the ground and in Sfat it's known if you dig you will find and when the Arabs came through here slaughtering Jews just because 1929 we're talking before the state of Israel before any claimed occupation or anything thank you to my patrons on patreon for funding my content I cannot make these videos without your support and I really appreciate it thank you patrons you're the best Shalom Chavirim and welcome to the city of Tzfat here in northern Israel. This is a city of many names with a very very interesting history and it has sort of become the epicenter of Jewish hippiness. We're in the top of the Metsuda Park. I'm here with my boy Nathan. How you doing my boy? Good to see you again. Yeah, we've got an insane view here. The Sea of Galilee. Tiberius. Just waiting for a uh, longtime internet friend. He's a local from Tzfat and uh, I'm really excited to learn all about the city. Eliyahu! Hey guys, welcome to Tzfat. <laughs> welcome to the video, man. Good <laughs> nice. to finally meet you. Finally, in person. Me and Eliyahu have been talking online for probably the better part of two years now. Much, something like that. Yeah. And we just pretty much found out recently that we're both from the same exact area in South Florida. Went to the same school. <laughs> Went to the same high school at one point. So uh, crazy to cross paths, but that's what it's like to be a Jewish person. There you go. Tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do here in Tzfat. All right, my name is Eliyahu Pereira. I uh, am a teacher here in Tzfat and uh, a resident. I live here. I like to bring people into the city to see this beautiful city and understand the deeper aspects of what Judaism is, what Jewish life is, what Kabbalah is, what Hasidut is, all these different forms of thought within the Jewish uh, world. And also to see the physical aspect of the city, which is an amazing city that uh, captures the heart. And uh, to go deeper into ourselves, to figure out who we are and why we're in this world and why the whole world hates us too is probably part of that uh, that question line what actually gravitated made you come here to the city what what makes you stay here it's a true question because as a as a I'll answer it, but I have to say first the asterisk I want to say first mm -hmm. which is that Sfat calls you and Sfat lets you go no one really decides to come here I wanted to be here because it's such a calm place that is completely um, detached from the rat race of, of what the, the rest of all the big cities in the world are going through and, uh, and the fire of everywhere else. I love Jerusalem. Jerusalem is my favorite place in the world. Uh, and with that said, I needed to calm down. I needed to be able to take that fire of Jerusalem and to come to this airy place and to, and to be able to be here and engaged in, in the deeper learning and, uh, and appreciate life more, to be with my wife, to be with the community, and to not worry about all the other things that the majority of the world is preoccupied with that once you get here you realize they're not that important. So that's... I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna uh, challenge you a little bit. Ahead. You said you want relaxation, airiness, a chilled out vibe, which I agree, that's what Sfat is like. But right now, you're brandishing an assault rifle and we just heard a fighter jet fly by as you were Correct. talking. Correct. Is Tzfat actually as chill as you're making it seem to be? It 100% is. It's here, thank God. Look at this, like we're on the top of a mountain. There's no, there's no imminent threat. Yeah, our neighbors in Lebanon want to shoot rockets here and there sometimes. We are uh, right now on top of the citadel, what's called the Mitsuda, the citadel. It is a, a fortress that was built by the Templars, actually, as part of the Crusades, when they came here on their conquest to... Uh, 
fight the Muslims and to fight the Jews and fight everybody to, for the Christians to take over the, the Holy Land of Israel. And this is one of their fortresses. Obviously, it's ruined. We can't really see it. You can see ruins of it. You have to control this spot if you want to have power in, in the region. And after that, it was conquered by the Muslims, by the Mamluks, and back and forth, back and forth. Tzfat was a city of, of the Kohanim, of the high priests of the temple. There was thousands and thousands of Kohanim, and not all of them spent every day in Jerusalem. Tzfat was one of those cities of refuge that held that held within it the Kohanim, the, the, the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel. And that's the first mention that we have of this city for sure, is after the first temple, there was a massacre that happened. They came to go after all of the Kohanim, which are the spiritual leaders. If you take the head off of the nation, the nation is much more confused. So there was a huge slaughter and a massacre that, came, that happened here. And from then on, Sfat has been a very, very, very important place. We have Meron across there. You can see the village that's on the mountain there. It's the second tallest mountain in Israel. Correct. Meron is the resting place of a sage from 2,000 years ago named Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the author of the Zohar and uh, the main download of Kabbalistic teachings that we've had. Tzfat became this place of like a hub for, for Jewish life and a hub for, for creation, of, for music, for art, for deep Torah thinking in the pragmatic laws of the Torah and also in the mysticism and the deeper Kabbalistic ideas in the Torah as well. Amazing. Should we go explore Tzfat? Let's go check it out. There's we'll actually, uh, there's, underneath us right now is a cistern of this Templar fortress that we can go in. This is the, the top half of it right here. And we'll talk about it when, it when it gets to a certain point, explain a little bit more of what is the more modern history of the Arab and Jewish relationship here. And I'm going to say this as a disclaimer already. Most likely throughout the video, I'm not going to use the word Palestinian because that's a made up thing. Um, but they are Arabs, right? They are Arab people. They're from the historic lineage of Arabia and there's no such thing as Palestine so if I don't say Palestinians just know I mean the same thing of what you think a Palestinian is I'm just gonna call them Arabs I gotta be honest Eliyahu spoke so much during this video I'm gonna have to cut a lot of it out and just post it as an exclusive clip on my patreon so if you want to learn more in depth about a lot of the things he's talking about in this video head to my patreon subscribe it's as low as five dollars and you'll gain access to all the stuff I didn't include in this video plus a lot more exclusive content uh, well, let's go into this cave the cave of wonders the cave of dreams in spot we call this the sound cave you see on the floor what is this this is an old tea candle right yeah. a tea candle why because at night obviously even day you can't see anything here candles get lit mm -hmm. because people come here at night and play music like you said and get together oh yeah you can see pretty good oh man i've missed this place i haven't been here in years this really is, in my opinion, one of the highlights of visiting Israel. It's a really special place. And this was used to store water, food, whatever it was, part of the part of the citadel. And this is one of the remaining structures that we have from what was. The IDF and the soldiers of Israel just went inside southern Gaza. It was to, to do some good work and to get back our hostages and to annihilate Hamas. Maybe we can call for a little bit of help for them from here. And what we like to do here is to scream out to Hashem, to God, with the word Abba, Father. So, I invite you guys to do it. I'm for sure going to do it. You're using every might that you have to ask for the Father of the whole entire world to have mercy on His children when they're doing the work that they need to be doing now. Okay. Ready? Let's do it. One, two, as, as hard as possible. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Abba! This is Tzfat. This is, this is the Tzfat that I know. <laughs> Try to praise John in the morning every morning. <laughs> oh man, this, I, that's why I love this city so much. <laughs> There's something really special about this place. So we're walking through an alleyway here that's very blue. <laughs> and I'm confused. I don't think I've ever been down this street before. And here, this is one of the oldest uh, synagogues in Tzfat. This is technically the, the great synagogue of Tzfat. The, it's called Abu Ab Synagogue. It was... A crazy story that you ask about practical Kabbalah, we talked about this a little bit. This synagogue, no one in Sfat 400 years ago 
ever had any recollection or knowledge of it being built. One morning, they woke up and the synagogue was here. A whole entire city tells the same story. It's not normal, right? The people that were living in Sfat came from Spain, right? They were kicked out of Spain and Portugal and they made their way here. This synagogue, exactly like this, existed in Spain. And it was led by the rabbi of Don Itzhak Abuav. Itzhak Abuav was a giant master in Torah and Kabbalah. The tradition is that it was done by way of Kabbalah, that the, the Itzhak wanted his synagogue to be here with his students. And even they brought his art scroll here his Torah scroll, which is the oldest Torah scroll in the world that's still in use. It's a 400, no, 500 year old Torah scroll wow. that is still in use. Three times a, a year, they bring it out. But they're in the wow. middle of prayers right now, so we cry, but you can go inside and Hi, yeah. As we walked outside one of the synagogues we visited, I noticed a man with a strange accent. I recognized that it was Farsi and immediately decided to strike up a conversation with him. Knowing that he was from Iran really pured my curiosity to hear his story during this very tense time in Israel, especially when Iran just kind of attacked us. Ah, you were born in Tehran? No, I was born in Shiraz. But oh, in Shiraz, I, I, wow. I went, I went to see my... because uh, I, I miss my, my mom. <laughs> the Shiraz, you know. So yeah. I went, I went visit like one week, and then I, I went back to uh, came to America. Since then, I didn't go. You escaped then, because of the Shah, because yeah, of the Islamic. Uh, no, I mean, I, 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 I escaped before that wow. because they wanted to take me to an Iranian army. Oh, they wanted yeah. to take you there. Uh, so, so I only, I, only way I could get out is to become a student. And, and a sign that I come back and, and, and I didn't have to go back because it was the revolution time. God. You still have family in Iran? No. No? I, mean, I even know I have nobody. This way? What's your name? My name is Yosef. Yosef, nice to meet you. Nice Yosef, okay. Very okay. nice to meet you. Okay. Yosef, yeah. go from here down the stairs yeah. all the way to the body. It's important to just to see what was the, the, the reality here in the city at this time in 1948 and when the British are ruling. This was the police station, okay? You can even see the bullets on, on there. Those bullets are from 1948. Oh, this is from the independence. This is from the War of Independence. Wow, right? so look at this, guys. This, this is the British police station. Really? Yeah, I've walked past this building so many times. I've been on the street a million times. I never knew this. Nobody so ever told me now this. Now it's a college, right? This is where the Arabs that we're talking about, they learn here, they learn also. There's their classrooms in here and, and faculty. So this is the, univer the current university. It's, it's part of the, yeah. Uh, wow, you can see, I don't know if you guys can really tell on the camera, but it's littered with bullet holes. There's bullet holes everywhere, penetrated through the concrete. It's very funny in Israel, we have kind of a fixation with leaving bullet holes everywhere. There's bullet holes all over this country. <laughs> Part of the reason is that uh, a lot of idiots in the world don't want to believe us when we tell them that we get attacked all the time. So let's leave a little bit of proof. At least if you come here and see with your own eyes, you're going to see that we're not lying. That is true. Right? <laughs> this is the, the infamous, famous, however you want to talk about it, staircase of Tzvah. There's over 250 stairs that go from here, from the, the main street of Tzvah down to the bottom. And uh, this was the border between the 
Jews to the right in the ancient city of Tzfat and the Arabs to the left. And the British, obviously, with their police station here, they kept this as a border and they policed it and they tried to make sure that the Jews and the Arabs were separate. Sounds like, what's that A word again? Apartheid. Uh, apartheid. Oh, Segregation. Yes. Correct, correct. Yeah. A European thing, not a, exactly a Middle Eastern thing. Right. So <laughs> הדוגמן מצפת. בוא תצטלם עם הנוף, כפרה. אתה תביא לי יותר צפיות, אחי. יוטיוב. לא בטיקטוק. בוא נעשה. אני בא אחרי זה, אנחנו נראה דמטה נחזור. כמה צפיות יש לך? המון. מיליארדים של טריליארדים. I love this country so much, man. It was so funny. <laughs> is this is this story though? I mean, obviously, I'm hearing it from you, but is there like factual evidence to it? What would the Palestinians say or the Arabs say? I haven't heard their side of the story. Uh-huh. Obviously, of course, everything of '48 is tied into Nakba and their whole narrative of that we came to genocide and right, to the ethnically and cleanse, and, them, and yeah, which wasn't the case. We were two people here, both fighting for the same land, and we won. Right? It's very simple. Right? Forget even the historical claims, is, is this our land, is it not our land? In modern terms, if you win a war, you win a war. Jewish quarter. Right, so here we're in the Jewish quarter, this is where the Jews lived. This whole entire area was began development in the end of the 1400s, beginning of the 1500s with the Spanish Inquisition that we talked about. <laughs> Definitely not. But one important thing about Tzfat, Tzfat is a place of of unity. Tzfat is a place that you can see many types of people, right? We have a whole bunch of guys here. Uh, having a nice uh, time and listening to some reggae. One important thing to see is, what does the sign say? The synagogue, Beit Knesset, Vizhnitz Tunis. Vizhnitz is a Hasidic group, and Tunis is Tunisia, right. Sephardim. Why is the synagogue called Vizhnitz Tunis, a Hasidic and Sephardic synagogue? It was a Vizhnitz synagogue, it was a Hasidic synagogue. They left, came in Tunisian Jews, they saw an abandoned synagogue, they started to use it. The, the Rebbe, the spiritual leader of the Vizhnitz community, came back one time to Tzvat. He sees a whole bunch of Sephardim in his shul. He says, no problem, you guys can have the shul, just leave the name Vizhnitz on it. So they call it Vizhnitz Tunis. So there's always this kind of compromise of, let's be together, let's not be separate, let's not... But you don't really find too many other places, even within the religious Jewish community, here in Tzvat. It's not a, it's not a wonder to walk inside a synagogue and see a soldier praying with a chassid, praying with a... Ethiopian, Ethiopian with an Indian Jew with a, it's all, it all everything worked. we just walked through was like 1700 mm-hmm. and till now and now we're going to like ancient ancient spots from the 1500s so I know redundant question but just I need to ask again so just to clarify yeah this was built by Jewish people yeah in Yehudim. the 1700s Yehudim Israelim yes. so not your white European immigrants not at all in the 1940s and people this is a common common misconception right put the camera on both of us yeah Look at our skin colors. My father is his color. I'm True. Sephardi. Nat- Natan's father is my color, kind of. <laughs> yes, and I'm Ashkenazi. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we're not European and we're not white. And even though you see my skin is like this, I'm not white when it comes to cultural whiteness. Right. right. The Europeans don't accept me as white. They don't see me as white. You've I'm never not. been accepted as a white person and up I, until now. Yeah, and I don't want to be one either. I'm a Jew. <laughs> I'm my own people. I have a 3,000 year old history. I don't want to be anybody else. I'm not a European. I happen to have family that went through an exile in Europe, but I'm not a European. I'm a Jew. Same way that I'm not an Arab or Iraqi. I had family that were there, but I'm not Iraqi by any means. Guys, we ran into Ronen. I've seen Ronen's face on YouTube. I would have never expected to run into him because I didn't know anything about him, but his face is very famous in Sfat. I will show you guys an image of it from a YouTube thumbnail. Can you tell me your story about this Lachuk shop in uh, right, Sfat? Alright, alright. First of all, Lachuk is uh, Yemeni origin uh, bread, Yemeni Jewish origin bread. And we make it unique and we make it uh, spicy, we make it tasty, we make it in a different way. And you can see how it's made here. Yes. Uh, also, it's uh, known around the world in different different name. It's the first bread man ever made. It's like the Moroccan barrer, the English crumpet, the in, uh, Indian uh, apam, or the Ethiopian uh, injera. They're all made from uh, different kind of flour. We make it from wheat semolina, and on top of it, we put the uh, local goodies of Tzfat or Israel, like the zatar, cheeses, vegetables, spices, herbs, and our special, special, special. Hot sauce. If you love spicy like me, Yamanite are spicy. 
Enjoy this. Well, then, Enjoy. can I ask you a quick question? Please. What's your family history? How did a Yemenite end up in Sfat? Oh, that's a good question. Follow the wife. <laughs> the wife, okay. Yes, yes. My Actually, my family, it's in a suburb of Tel Aviv, Rishon Lezion. But I came to Tzfat like uh, 20 years ago, 2004. Uh, me and my wife, we want something uh, spiritual, we want something different, we want something more authentic, more ethnic, and we come to the, this place. In Tzfat, he's got the Lachuch Tzfati shop here in the middle of the market. Appreciate you, brother. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Now we're heading into Tzfat Distillery. This is a place that I've been involved with since the day one, since the day one of the of the project. Basically, Israel had a revolution in 2014 of uh, higher end alcohol. We all like to drink, but to make it quality. And uh, this was a project that we made to create a store, a visiting center that can hold all of these premier Israeli beverages that are being made on a very high level, boutique things and to present it in a beautiful location that you can come have a drink you can also come to taste a variety of different beverages that Israel is making right now everything is completely Israeli made we have also the art and the Judaica and one amazing thing that happened is while we were renovating here this was just a small store here this whole entire area was an outdoor courtyard ruins from 400 years ago Wow! not touched we built it up, put a roof on it put in this lounge area so you can have a place to relax and to taste your things. Is this where Jews party nowadays? And Sfat, this is one of the spots, one of the spots. <laughs> and, and then in the back here, these two passes that you can see, these arches, was an apartment of single guys. Wow. Right behind this arch was the shower and the bathroom of the apartment. We didn't need a shower in the middle of our store, so we started to dig to move the plumbing to put the bathroom in a different location, and the drill went through the ground. And in Sfat, it's known that... If you dig, you will find. Why? It's an ancient city on a mountain that is known to be on a fault of earthquakes. And when earthquakes happen, there's destruction. And the way that they would do it in Sfat is whenever a building would fall after an earthquake, they take out the bodies, res uh, respectfully bury them, and they just use the walls, because usually the walls don't fall, the, the floors fall, the mm. ceilings and the floors. So they cave in, take the wall, fill in the cavity, and build on top. Right? So when we drilled and the drill went through the ground, we realized we found something. It took us three, four months of excavation with our hands of taking all the dirt and the rocks out. And let's go check out what we found. You, you physically and your friends, like you did this? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of Hebra here in Tzfat that work together. Wow. In the, the ancient city of Tzfat from around the 1700s. So we're talking 300 years. This is so cool. Okay. And down here now we house, we have obviously a wine cellar. We even know whose house this was, right? There's a, a mikveh. This was part of a mikveh. Really, the, the structure of what you can see right now is not the complete thing. If you look here at the back, we have it blocked off somewhat. But inside of that hole, mm -hmm. inside there is like another 100 meter uh, hall. Wow. Like that we just, we can't go in there because we want to continue living here, right? And there's a whole city on top of that we can't. God forbid, cause any damage right. and people's lives are ruined. Tzfat is a city of, uh, of sages, of smart people. A lot of writing, a lot of literature, a lot of things were recorded. And we know from the books that there was a certain Jew that lived here, that came here in the 1700s. He was living in Europe and he moved to the land of Israel, like, which is the dream of every Jew, at least should be. He was named Rav Yanko the Doctor. Jacob the doctor. He was a doctor in Europe that had a dream of living in the land of Israel and just learning to work. January 1st, 1837, there's an earthquake in Sfat. Two thirds of the population is wiped out. At the time, there was about 4,000, give or take, people living here. Two thirds of them dead. And he survived. And then he realized that you can make deals with God, but God runs the show in the end of the day. <laughs> You're in the, the only doctor in the area and you survived an earthquake, right? So he started to come back to. To, to his practice and to, to, to help Jews and he helped many Jews survive from their and from their injuries and also to rehabilitate rehabilitate and come back to their life so this was his house he had a mikveh here and he had a we know that it's written in the books that he was in between two synagogues and this is the only place that it could be no one had known where this place was until we accidentally found it right by just trying to do a renovation in our store look at the style the style is so cool man 
And you see here, this is another artist. This is a history. That- boy, this is some history right here, boy. <laughs> I think people don't think about it enough, and you probably you could agree with me on this, is like when we're talking about history in Israel specifically, and Israelis and Jews generally have a knack for this because we see it face to face a lot. The layers of history here, they're not, it's its not like what you see superficially. You know, Palestinian villages are a very recent, very recent thing. Under most of these Arab villages or Palestinian villages that you would see in Israel, even the modern day Israeli villages and towns that you see today, there are thousands of years of history that's completely erased by something that's been put on top of it. And this just right here is more proof of Jewish history in this land. In classic Jewish fashion, Eliyahu was pouring me at a Chaim. You said it's called a Bucha? Bucha. Exactly. Never heard of this before. Is fig alcohol, a fig uh, liquor, right? And uh, it's quite expensive because figs are not a cheap uh, fruit. Uh. Figs are one of my favorite fruit. Maybe, maybe my favorite fruit in the world. I and love figs. It's one figs. of the seven species of the land of Israel. So, the seven species that the land of Israel is blessed with. One of them is figs. Nechaim, guys. Nechaim, Chabibi. Nechaim, Eliyahu. Oh wow, it's sweet. It's, it's good. Sweet, but then it's like very. It's really easy. It's really easy to take it down goes too. Down, yeah. It didn't hurt me physically. There we go. That was nice. Wow, I don't. I I don't think I've ever seen a Jewish synagogue with something like this. Like this is the Aron Kodesh where the Torah is, but I, this almost looks like the Hindu temple. Straight up, it looks like Hindu temples I've seen in Sri Lanka. I've never seen this level of design in a synagogue before. That is so, so, so cool. Wow. Also, the whole design of this place. My God, you can tell it's definitely Ottoman in structure. Like the facades on the wall. But wow, that is so cool. The guy asked that you cover your head in a holy place. Of course. Hang on. So this, this was actually an Arona Kodesh that was brought over from Europe. Um, beautiful artistry as well, right? But I want to show you guys a miracle that happened here. Crazy thing. They were coming to pray in 1948. They were praying here, the Jews, as we do three times a day. And all of a sudden, part of our prayer, right? A person could be standing, and at a certain part of our prayer, we bow down to God, right? As the whole entire synagogue is coming to the point where they're meant to bow down, a rocket hits outside and shrapnel starts to fly in this hole and it says right there Nes Hagasis the miracle let me show that right there the miracle Nes Hagasis of the fragment of the shrapnel wow as all the Jews are bowing down to God shrapnel flies over their head and, and hits right here and this is one of the remnants there's obviously there were other places but they left this one here so to be able to give over this story wow so you see when did this happen this was in 1948 part of the that's so cool i saw something on the corner of my eye that i couldn't disregard ah. i thought this was so cool because i only recently learned that unicorns are part of uh, jewish uh, mythology and uh correct do you have any information for me <laughs> um there there's an animal called the tachash tachash which we don't exactly know what it was right but its skin was used for the uh, for the Mishkan, which is what's called the Tabernacle, a portable temple, the, what, what, what we had in the desert before the temple, right? There was a tabernacle that M- Moses created. Um, some opinions are that that animal, the Tachash, only existed for a period of history, and it was during that time uh, when they w- when it was needed for the Mishkan. And it's described the Tachash is described as a Chad Keren, like as yeah. a one-horned animal. Unbelievable. So I've never seen a, a, like a depiction of it in a synagogue before. <laughs> this is so cool. Subscribe to my YouTube channel all about mythology called Mytho Safari. I'm going to do an episode about the Jewish unicorn coming up very soon. Usually in the synagogues you don't have anything especially like this, right? And that's why it's on the side. If this were to be in the front of the synagogue in the direction that we pray, we wouldn't be allowed to stand in front of this and pray. Right. Because Jews, we believe in one God and God that is one. Meaning he has no image, he has no form. I've never really seen all this beautiful art and this animals thing. and stuff like this in a synagogue. Because usually in synagogues, Jews devoid, like they avoid putting some sort of life like an animal or a human. Same thing as Muslims, but in churches you'll see like uh, they'll put pictures of Jesus. And that uh, is something, that's why we're not allowed to pray in churches as Jews. But this is very, very cool. A little bit of like a hidden mythological secret of Judaism there. So this is a mikveh from 600 years ago. 
proof again of Jewish life here in the ancient city of Tzfat. And um, it's an interesting story that's told here often. The Arizal, this Tzfat figure that we always keep talking about, this Kabbalist, he was uh, made to swear to his mom from a young age that he wouldn't go to the mikveh in the winter when it was cold. Why? He was naturally always uh, not the strongest person with the immune system, and his mother wanted to protect him, so she made him uh, promise him. So how would the Arizal go to the mikveh in Tzfat when a Kabbalist goes every single day, sometimes multiple times a day, and it's cold? So right there in the wall is volcanic rock. Volcanic rock can hold heat. So they would take rocks like that, heat them up inside a furnace, throw them inside the mikveh, and then he was able to go to the mikveh even in the winter when his mom didn't want to Straight up a hot tub mikveh. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, where are we now? We are in a place called Livnot. This place is called Beta Kahal. This was a community center, right, in Tzfat 600 years ago. This was a bakery that was a bakery 500 years ago, and it was also a bakery 100 years ago. In 1929, throughout Israel, there were a lot of attacks against the Jews by Arabs in Hebron, in Jerusalem, in Tiberia, in Tzfat. In Tzfat, the, the massacre of 1929 was horrible. And, and there's always been like these 18-year-old kids, 20-year-old kids that come here and backpack and volunteer here, and they excavated this place. And while they were here digging, this door here was open, the door behind us, and a guy, this was uh, about 20 years ago, the story, a uh, man walked by here, a 90-year-old man, and he sees these young Jews in here excavating and uncovering this place, and he breaks down crying. Now, a 90-year-old man starts crying like a little baby, you know, they sat him down, they tried to get him some water until he got back to himself, and they, they asked him, what happened? You just walked by, you're normally walking, and you broke down crying. He says, when I saw Jews here again, uncovering this place, I couldn't help myself. They said, why, what's the problem, what's the story? When that guy, that 90-year-old man, was a baby, meaning 90 years before that, we're talking now 100 years ago, in the 20s, 1929 specifically, he was a baby and this was his parents and his grandparents' bakery. And when the Arabs came through here, slaughtering Jews throughout the city of Tzfat just because, 1929, we're talking before the state of Israel, before any claimed occupation or anything, Ottoman right, and British rule. And they came in here, there's stairs that go all the way down here. The, this guy's grandmother put him as a baby, a, a couple month old baby, inside a flower bag and threw the flower bag down the bottom of the stairs and his whole entire family was killed. And only afterwards, the rest of the Jews that were in the city started to go around and see what's, what's the situation in the city. Once the Arabs left, they heard a baby crying at the bottom of the stairs here. And now he comes back as a 90-year-old man and he sees 18-year-old Jewish guys and girls uncovering this place. Wow. He broke down. He couldn't, he couldn't keep the, the emotion in. And this is the reality that we're living in. Like Jewish history that, that doesn't end and it's not just 3,000 years old. It's also 100 years old and it's also relevant now. I say this always in my videos, I, I really, I need you guys to remember this. When we're walking through a place where Eliyahu is giving us direct history to an event that happened here, please do not let anybody sell you on this idea that Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived in peace in this land no. prior to the creation of the State of Israel. There were times where things were okay. That's what Jewish existence was in our own land. It was tolerated. Here you have direct proof of an event that happened in 1929, well before the establishment of the state of Israel, well before mainstream Zionism, of a massacre committed against Jews, and you have the actual historical site uncovered that you guys can come and visit. You can see this. You can tell your people. You can tell your friends. Don't let anybody sell you on this idea that we lived in peace, because it wasn't true. It never has been, ever. Maybe tolerance, but definitely not peace. Yeah. Never. We, in, when we were in Muslim rule, we were second, we were dhimis, right? Second class citizens that didn't have full rights. And the same thing with the Christians. It's always been that way. Okay, a 700 year old synagogue. Correct. This is the synagogue of the Arizal. I mean, he didn't build it, right? Oh. But he, he prayed here and learned here. And there's even a, a room wow. inside, a cave inside, where he learned with Elijah the prophet. Let's go, let's go check it out. That's the thing, in Sfat, right, and a lot of other places, you go to a place that has a 700-year-old history, it's just a museum. Yeah. Here it's alive.
Here you go. This room, this room was uh, a room that the Ariza, or Isaac Luria, was able to seclude himself and to, to get to a higher level of consciousness. And according to what he says, and the people that were here, his students, they say that it was very common for the Ariza to come in here and sit in here for hours in deep meditation and actually have downloads from Elijah the Prophet, the Yahweh and to come out with these deeper insights and that in, later on in life became known as the Lurianic Kabbalah system that everybody that's following Kabbalah still follows to this day. Um, this was... This is where that room, this, this is where it took place. This is the room. This wow. Is right. Again, Tzfat, that's, a, that's another thing that's very important to say. Tzfat has continuous Jewish living here. Even if we were being slaughtered, even if we were being chased, the Jews never left Tzfat. So this is a 700-year-old synagogue, but I have friends here that they've been 700 years in Tzfat, before the Spanish Inquisition, right? So when we give over, it's not like, oh, we think that this was the room. No, no, like father after son, we know exactly where these things are. And these are, these are the guys you were saying that are learning right now? Correct. Some high-level stuff. They're, yeah, I don't even know how to explain it right now, what they're learning, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's Kabbalah. <laughs> and this is a Sephardic, uh, this is a Sephardic synagogue. synagogue. Eliyahu, what a insightful day. So hard. much fun. Guys, check out his content down below in the description, and we'll see you guys in the next one. I love you. Long time. Goodbye, Clats. If you believe in my content and want to support me, just know your help is needed. There's a bunch of great ways to monetarily support the channel. Some of the best ways to support me happen to be PayPal, buy me a coffee, or joining our Patreon community. Links to them can be found in the pinned comments or the description of every one of my videos. Joining my Patreon community gives you access to exclusive content and the chance to talk to me on our Discord server. I also go live almost every day here on YouTube. And after my live streams, me and my patrons from Patreon head over to our Discord server to an exclusive after-party hangout. Your support is the only way that I can keep creating the content that you love watching for me. Thank you.